back up to that first step. Uh, it's, uh... I am Jonathan from Hindenburg, and I am here with uh, Joe Davis of uh, voiceactor.com. And for those people who don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about your entire life story and how you how you got into doing uh, this business, or the, I should say these businesses? I thought you were going to say how I got into a private jet, but I will, right. I'll talk about the businesses instead. What led you to the private jet life? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I, I really wanted my own couch on an airplane, and I couldn't afford to bring a couch on an airplane, so I decided getting a private jet was the next best thing. Makes sense. Um, so I, uh, I've been doing digital stuff for a long time. Uh, started out about 30 years ago. Believe it or not, I know I don't look like it. Uh, but I uh, started out building websites before the internet had graphics uh, and in Unix and a Pico editor, if that means anything to anyone. But uh, it was literally before you, there could be graphics on the internet. And then um, the wow. first search engine I optimized for was AltaVista. So that's going back to the you know Netscape days and have been doing web dev and um, digital marketing ever since. And in about 2011, uh, I got involved in the voiceover industry because of a, a very dear friend of mine um, who's a, a voice actor and a home studio guy. He helps people build home studios and does audio analysis, all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, I helped him with some of his things and he has a, a show and he said, why don't you come on my show and uh, just talk about what you do? And so I did, and I, I expected it to just be a, a fun little thing. And the next day, the phone started ringing from voice actors. And I was like, this is, this is interesting. So I spent about a year, year and a half learning about VO, um, started doing VO myself, and realized that there was an amazing community out there of independent business people that had needs that dovetailed with what I could do. And so I uh, launched Voice Actor Websites, which is a custom website building and marketing uh, business for voice talent, also agents, casting directors, producers, et cetera. And, um, and then more recently, uh, we created voiceactor.com, which is a do-it-yourself website builder for voice talent. So basically, you can go and in a few minutes, build a professional-looking website that you can manage yourself. And so um, I would say the, the areas that I'm most interested in are the creation of web platforms and websites, search engine optimization, which is the process of getting something high in the search engine, and then now um, AI and how it's relating to the industry and how it can be used as a, a tool, um, what the, the dangers are there, et cetera. So, so let's start with the, the, the thing that absolutely affects everybody, which you've already mentioned, which is SEO. So SEO or search engine optimization is anything that can positively impact your ranking in a search engine. And when I say a search engine, generally we mean Google because they're you know, 80, 90% of the, the market share. Um, there's Bing, there's Yahoo, there's a DuckDuckGo, but the majority of people's traffic comes from Google. And not everything that works for Google works for the other ones, but there's a tremendous amount of overlap. And so uh, SEO is kind of broken into two overarching umbrellas. You have on-page and off-page. And on-page is anything you can do on your actual website to improve its rank. Off-page or off-site is anything that's not actually on your, your website that um, improves the rank. And so uh, let me start with off-site or off-page because it's a much smaller list. Mm -hmm. Essentially, Google was trying to replicate something that manifests in the real world, which is that if something has value and is popular, people are often talking about it. And um, what the online equivalent of that were relevant contextual backlinks from high domain authority websites. What that means in English, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Perfectly> <laughs> what that means in English is essentially when one website links to another one, if website A is relevant to what you do, so it's about podcasting, it's about voiceover, it's about corporate narration, it's about whatever the, the topic is of your website, if that links to you and that website itself is strong, it passes some authority or link juice, as we call it in the, uh, in the industry, um, over to you. And so the more votes you get in favor of your site, the better. Now, not all links are good. They can actually hurt you too. So if the other website is spammy or is completely not relevant uh, or is of a low quality, <clears throat> it might not help you or it might even hurt you. So you don't want just links for the sake of links. 
But if you have really good websites that are relevant to you and your business uh, or whatever you're doing, if they link to you, that's generally a good thing. Also brand mentions. So if you have the Jonathan Hurley podcast and you get written up in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, that's going to be a strong indicator to Google that there's merit in what you're doing, that um, it's popular enough that it's on the radar of legitimate sources and they're talking about you. So those brand mentions and links are, there's some other things, but those are the two really key ingredients in off-page SEO. On-page is much more complex and it ranges from how fast is your website. There's something called core web vitals, which Google introduced, which is a series of metrics, things like LCP, which is largest contentful paint. Um, basically, how long does it take for the largest element on your page to load? And if it takes more than 2.5 seconds, you fail. Um, CLS, which is content layout shift. And so when things load on your site, if you've ever gone to a, a site and then the page loads and then an image loads in and everything shifts down or shifts over, right. that's called content layout shift. If that happens in um, over 0.1 seconds, then you fail. So these are, are technical things that are, I'd say, harder for the average person to have control over. But things that you can much more easily have control over are things like having good content with uh, H1 tags. So if you think back to kind of English class and, and the hierarchy of, uh, of a paper, um, you want to have a, a title that really encompasses what that page is about and place that in something called an H1 tag. And every platform has a different way of creating it. But um, if you, let's say you're using WordPress or Wix or Squarespace or something like that, you can just Google, how do I create an H1 tag in that platform? And you want to put the keywords that you want that page to rank for in the H1 tag. Um, if you, it, it's very, very hard to get one page to rank for a lot of disparate keywords. So ideally, as you're creating your content, you want to have pages that are dedicated to ranking for something specifically. And so like we, we've got a, a voice actor that we've been working with for many years. She has hundreds of pages on her site and she has a page for corporate narration. She has a page for e-learning. She has a page for government e-learning. She has a page for aerospace e-learning, et cetera, et cetera. So the more and they're different separate pages entirely. Yes. Okay. And so the more granular you can get, the better. If, if you think of, Google, the analogy I like to use is partially a popularity contest, and that speaks to the links and the brand mentions that we were talking about, mm -hmm. and then partially a relevancy engine where it's trying to serve the most relevant result to a searcher's intent. And so let's just walk through a hypothetical. Let's say someone's looking for a government e-learning narrator, and somebody has a website about voiceover. Is it related? Yeah, but could it be more relevant? It could. So now let's say you have a secondary level where you have a page for all those top level genres that you do. Um, one for e-learning, one for corporate narration, one for um, video games, et cetera. And so uh, Google looks at that and says, all right, the website's about voiceover and it's about e-learning. Is it related? Yeah, more so than the first example, but could it be even more related? It could. And so now you, you have a tertiary level where not only do you have an e-learning page, but then off of that, you have another one, which is specifically for government e-learning or aerospace or all the other types of e-learning that you want to rank for. And you craft those pages around those search terms. So when I was talking about the H1 tag, you put those keywords, you, you know, you say something like government e-learning narrator or female or male government e-learning narrator and so on and so forth. So um, the more specific you can get on a particular page, the better. Do you suggest to people to, let's say it's a podcast in this case, mm -hmm. to actually title their things a certain way? Yeah, it's a really good question. The The titles are extremely example, <laughs> extremely good example of um, how you can incorporate keywords into your digital strategy. Um, by the way, I really like the idea of a podcast called Birds Riding in Cars. And yeah. there's all <laughs> kinds of possibilities there. Uh, so the... The more brandable you go with something, meaning the less used a set of words are, the higher the likelihood that you'll be able to rank for it. But also, so there's less competition, but it also means that there's probably less people searching for it. The more generic you go, probably the more people that are searching for it, 
but the more competitive it is. So there's always a kind of a, a balance there of trying to figure out, are you going for um, maybe a, a smaller audience, but getting there faster or a larger audience and getting there a little bit slower. But in, in terms of the, the actual words, so almost all algorithms, actually all algorithms use what you name something as part of their ranking strategy, whether it's a podcasting platform, uh, you know, whether it's iTunes or whether it's Google. And so having your, your podcast overall be descriptive and then having your podcast titles be descriptive is very important. And so I think in an ideal world, you, you try to balance the two. So if it's the Jonathan Hurley podcast, you, you know, uh, saying Hurley talks search engine optimization or um, everything you need to know about SEO with Jonathan Hurley, that's combining the two where you're, you're getting those keywords in there of SEO or search engine optimization, if that's what you're talking about, but you're also getting your name and your brand in there. And so going only in one direction or only in the other means you're probably missing out on opportunity because not everybody's searching for Jonathan, Hur uh, Jonathan Hurley and not everybody is searching and every, people are searching for SEO. That's a really competitive term. Right. Okay. So let's use another example for our audiobook voiceover friends. I've got my homepage and I think, okay, when anybody comes to my page as a voice actor, I want to show them demos, right? I mean, that's kind of the first thing that's on everybody's page. So I have two kind of two questions. One, do you have related to this, when people make demos, do you have um, any specific tips on that as it pertains to this stuff, uh, like length of time and titling? And then I hadn't actually thought about this before, but would you suggest putting each demo on a separate clickable page because of this? Ah, yeah. Uh, the When someone comes to your website, you want to give them the ability to find what they're looking for without having to go deeper. So when I say uh, that site has hundreds of pages, you don't go to the website and see hundreds of pages listed. You, you see the homepage with ideally demos above the fold, meaning um, without having to scroll down. You don't want a talent seeker, meaning someone that's going to hire you, to have to search because remember, they're not just looking at your website, they're probably looking at dozens or maybe even more than that. And so every 30 seconds or minute that you add to their day, multiply that by all the people that they're looking for. And if they can't find something quickly, they may just leave. So mm -hmm. I would say on your homepage, you want your most prominent genres first, and then maybe a read more button or a listen more button or a hear more button. And so maybe you pick your top three or your top six and you have those demos sit there. And then if you have more than that, put them on internal pages. So you can have a, a menu where it says, you know, demos or genres, and then they could click on e-learning or they could go deeper and click on a specific type of e-learning. Same thing with audiobooks. They could click on audiobooks or they could go to a specific genre of audiobook. And so there's a hierarchy where it, do it doesn't feel overwhelming and someone can find what they're looking for quickly. In terms of demo length, uh, the larger an audio demo is, the more time it will take to load on a website. And so you don't want to go too long. And so I would say, I'm going to talk file size as opposed to audio length, and then I'll talk about audio length. So okay. something that's a meg, two megs, three megs, four megabytes is probably okay. 10 megabytes is probably too much because the way it gets loaded into a page, it, it takes time. And so someone might click on the play button. It doesn't work because it hasn't loaded yet. And it's also, if you remember before when I was talking about all that technical gibberish of LCP, you know, part of Core Web Vitals, if yes. you have a 10 megabyte file that's loading on your page, that's going to really hurt your Core Web Vitals. So okay. from a human perspective and from a SEO perspective, you generally don't want large audio files. We're ending most of these um, conversations and these AMAs with asking about AI because everybody has a different take on it. And uh, I'm very excited to ask this um, uh, with you because I think you could give us a, a better working understanding of what AI is as it pertains to this, because it's a broad term that people are hearing about every single day now. Uh, but uh, and so, what is it from your perspective uh, as it relates to these fields? And then, what do you think its impact already has been on just the voiceover industry? And what do you think it will be in roughly five years? 
So let me first ask you a question. How long do you think AI has been around for? And the reason okay. I ask that is because there's been this explosion in the last six months to a year where everybody's talking about it. And I think that the general public thinks that AI is brand new on the scene. So AI or artificial intelligence was generally considered to be around since the 60s in the form of machine learning. And so um, when we use the term AI or artificial intelligence, I, I think a lot of people think uh, cognition, awareness, some sort of uh, consciousness by a machine. Now, the, the fact is that the AI researchers, developers have tried to recreate what happens in a human brain in a machine, where essentially you have inputs, that information is stored and processed in some way, and there are weights associated with that. So if I look at a stove, I think about food, I think about um, heat, I think about uh, metal. So th there's a there's relationships between what I the input and the different things that are stored in my brain, and that process has been duplicated in electronics. And so um, where we are today is that, well, actually, let, let's back up a little bit. So up until about 2015. AI was fairly inaccessible to the average person. So when we talk about the revolution in AI, it really has been more about a democratization of AI than it has been that there's been um, a huge leap forward. There has been a, a significant step forward in terms of processing power. So uh, the ability to process more information is greater now than ever. But before you had to be a developer, you had to be a coder to interact with AI and the AIs were fairly limited in their knowledge base because of the way they were trained. Between 2015 and today, the AIs advanced significantly in their ability to understand natural language from people and then carry out acts based on that. And so that's where the, the, the I think the biggest leap has happened that now anybody can go on Google Bard, ChatGPT, or any of the other AIs, and just say, hey, can you give me a chicken soup recipe? Or can you give me the, um, the meaning of this equation? Or can you write this code? And it will do it. You don't have to say, A equals the number of visits to a website. B equals the number of demos I have. C equals this request, you know, and code it out. And so um, what that has resulted in is the use of AI by companies that never <clears throat> either had an interest or the ability to use it across a variety of industries. Voiceover is one of them, but it's being used in translation, it's using, being used in graphic design, in video editing, in, in all these different fields where it really wasn't applied broadly before. And so there, there are tremendous benefits. You can automate things that would have taken a long time before. Um, there's also, I would say gonna be a significant impact on jobs across these industries, content writers, voice actors, um, graphic designers, all these fields that required creative input, at least on the low end, it can be done by a machine now, um, for better or worse. And I, I think that just in, in talking to the, the creatives that I know in these fields, that low end of the market is going away. It, and so now you're going to have a, a mid range and a high end that are still serviced by humans, but you're not necessarily as a, a voice actor, you're not going to get hired to do a YouTube video anymore because an AI can do it. Um, maybe it won't do as good a job. Maybe it won't get the uh, inflection perfectly, but it's good enough for the, the person that's creating that project. And so I, I think one of the things that's not really being examined is the impact 10, 20 years from now, and I'll give you an example. I was talking to a translator the other day and she works with large companies. And I said, how do you think AI is gonna affect your job? And she said, my job I think is secure because companies don't just hire me to translate text. I'm on conversations with executives. They hire me to read body language, to understand inflection and say, oh, this person actually meant this. And so I, I'm, I, I think until the time I retire in you know, 15, 20 years, I'll be fine. What I'm concerned about is that I started out, not me, but this translator, uh, started out 
translating text, just simply translating text, and then built her way up. And she said, because of AI, there those people are not going to be coming in. The people who start at the, the bottom and just start out uh, translating text won't become translators because there's no work for them. And so as the current generation retires, who's going to yeah. fill that void of the high-end work? And I think that's a, a, a danger in all the fields that we talked about and other ones. And so how do we ensure that there's people of a certain caliber that come into the industry and can service it when the low end work isn't there? Right. How would you prepare for these coming changes and how it would affect them? So specifically in VO, there are the longer a piece of audio is, the harder it is for AI to do it. And so I think um, industries like audiobooks probably have more longevity than something like I said, like an explainer video on YouTube. And so if you're if you're looking for um, areas of VO that still will need a human a year or two or three from now or five or, or maybe more, longer form narration, um, things that require a lot of humanity. Uh, and I, I say that because reading a script, like uh, just being informative is much easier for an AI than to say, oh, you know, I really, really loved meeting you. You know, next time we're going to have to, because I, I'm adding a lot of emotion into it. And that's much harder right. for an AI. So, um, you know, animation, video games, those type of things. And, and I think that the high end of things like commercial is going to stay there. So low end commercials that are on um, Pandora or YouTube, some of those will probably go the AI route. But uh, I don't think that Ford or Coca-Cola are going to be using AI voice actors in the near future um, for a variety of reasons. There's also work that's covered by sag after rules. And of course, there was the strike. Um, so there's, right. there's going to be work that stays if you can get into the union. Um, there will be union work that will stay human probably for the foreseeable future. So for the, for the 55-year-old man example, um, I think they're probably okay across a variety of genres. Uh, but if you're looking at this as a long-term career, I think there's certain areas that you're going to probably have to focus on in order to get work you know, in the years to come. Joe, that was fantastic. There's so much good information there for our users. Uh, we really, uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everybody.